All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's stream. Today, I have a special guest. I have Susan Walsh, who is the queen of data, dirty data, data cleaning, data quality. She's also the biggest uh, Robbie Williams fan of the world behind me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and so let's bring her in. <laughs> Hi, hey, how are you? <laughs> Hi, good. Great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me on. It's nice to have a chat with you. Well, same here. Um, let's say quickly hello to our audience. Hi, everybody. I already see Atlas here. Hello, and Kate. Yay! Hey, Kate. You, you can't can push me under anything from here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, if anybody has a question, and I'm guessing with Susan, there will be a lot of questions because she has very interesting topics. Oh, yeah. And uh, put them in the chat. We're going to answer them. I'm going to be here. Uh, yeah. Well, Susan, for everybody of my people who may be not so familiar with what you do, can you say a few words about what yes. you do? Yeah, I'm, so I fell into data by accident completely. Uh, this was about 11 years ago. Um, before this, I had a clothes shop and it didn't work out. And I racked up so much debt that I couldn't even afford to go bankrupt. I had to save up for six months, 600 pounds to go bankrupt. And I just needed a job desperately. And I found an ad online to go and work for a spend analytics company, uh, classifying spend data for procurement teams. And I thought, yeah, that would be a nice, you know, filler job until I get something else. And I ended up spending five years with them. I grew a team of 14 people, managed all the projects, classified all kinds of different types of data. And then eventually that business got bought and I, I didn't like moving from a, a really agile startup to a clunky corporation. And so because I hadn't come from a procurement world or the data world, I didn't really know where I could get a job doing the same thing. So I decided to set up the classification guru and that was six years ago. And since then, I've been working with clients, uh, mainly in the procurement space. So we still classify, spend data, normalize suppliers and build spend taxonomies. But since then, it's grown arms and legs. And now we clean CRM systems, ERPs, supplier information, addresses, databases, pretty much everything you can think of. All the really horrible, messy jobs that nobody else wants to do, we'll do them. Okay. And I'm based in the UK, but um, have clients all over the world. So it's not just a UK problem. Okay, that sounds interesting. Does it? So you, the companies that you're working with, are these also like these larger corporations? They are global brand name companies that you would know. Okay. However, most I can't talk about most of the companies I work with because they don't want to admit that they have a problem. So I have to stay under the radar. But that's actually something that is very interesting and fits to data engineering because people always ask like, how can I, how can I prepare for becoming a data engineer? How can I do real world problems? You usually don't know about the real world problems because no company is saying we have problems with this, with that, and with that. And so... I get asked all the time, how, how, how can I practice? How can I get experience doing this? Um, and the advice that I normally say is go on a freelancer website and find those really crappy jobs that pay no money and get yeah. lots of practice cleaning their dirty data. You won't make any money, but you will gain so much experience from it. Um, that's how I kind of built my knowledge and, mm. and skills up. Just by, by that, doing that kind of stuff. Is in this in this area the data or the dirty data coming from people putting in weird stuff? Or is yep. that machine made? No, no. Data problems are 99.9% .9 people problems because even okay. the machine data comes from a person at some point. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and unfortunately, a lot of the people who input data are not data professionals. 
And so I'm I'm very kind of firm believer that we need to talk to them in less intimidating language, make it a little bit more, dare I say, fun. Um, <laughs> so, you know, things like I wrote, this is my book, Between the Spreadsheets, you know, so it's a play on words. It sounds a bit kind of cheeky, naughty, but to get people who are not interested in this world, and I know it's hard to believe there's people that are not, we need to make it more interesting and less intimidating for them. Um, Mm. So that's kind of my passion as well, is to get everybody on board with with cleaning the data and the data quality, because it helps all of us in the end. Hmm. That's true. Are are you also helping with, like, UIs or, or basically the input designs so because i'm guessing that's also a problem right no but it is and i'll tell you the biggest problem um kind of uis but not really when we search for companies to find out what they do so that we can classify them correctly the number of websites and we're talking the biggest of companies who say we are leaders in our field we're experts in this area and have you know decades of experience They don't say which field they're leaders in. They don't say what experience they've got. And when you go to their services, it doesn't tell you what they do. It's a huge problem. So that's why I called the business the classification guru, because I wanted people to know straight away from the name what we did. And then I've been made been pretty passionate about making sure that my my website is very clear about what we do as well, because it's a, a real frustration um, for us when we're trying to figure out what a company does and, There's like, you know, there's pictures of like, I mean, you know, buildings and stuff and and what they do has got nothing to do with buildings. So how how can I imagine the work as a person who's doing data or who's doing classification? Like, Um, what? what Okay, let's take it to your personal bank statements. Uh Uh-huh. So what you'll have, and it, you know, normally it'll all be in one one line in your bank statement. Um, when it's a business, you'll have the company name and then the invoice description. So what you might have is uh, McDonald's and a Big Mac, or it might be Uber and it's been a journey. Do 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 do. And so whereas on your bank statement, it's just like one one thing, not broken down. Spend data, well, like staples or office, um, office supplies. You'll have like pens, pencils, paper, notepads, binders. So we'll classify those individually. So um, to different levels. So level one might be facilities. Level two might be office supplies. And then level three might be desk supplies, printing supplies, and then you could go to a level four or five even, depending on on how much detail you need. But it's so that procurement people can go to their suppliers that they're buying these things from and say, well, you know, we we did 10 million with you last year. You know, we want better rates when we're buying pens Mm -hmm. and pencils and paper from you. Um, you know, we'll consolidate these five suppliers into one and we'll give you all our business if you give us a big discount. So that's what they're they're doing with that kind of thing. Uh-huh. But it, but you can do it yourself with your own banking app. You know, you can categorize your spend by marketing, professional services and um, travel. It's exactly the same. So you could you could even try it in your own finances. It might yeah. give you a fright, though. I know that from from my my company because my wife is doing the accounting. She's the accountant. Yeah. And she's also in charge of basically she has a program that gets all the bank statements, automatically downloads them. And then they need to be classified into where does this go into which account in the yeah. accounting software. And like there are, I don't know, 20 accounts. Yeah. <laughs> you have to know this needs to go there and this is this and like so can you imagine on a business scale it's huge and those yeah. little charts of accounts are too generic and too vague which is why you need to go into like more more detail um but but it's really important and it can also help with things like fraud as well you know mm. the bigger the company the more likely you are to have things like fraud going on and if you're not 
monitoring what's happening, then it can easily slip through the net. Did you have such such cases before? Um, I wouldn't say I've I've ever discovered massive fraud, but what you do find is, and you know, you probably work for large organizations too. You get a company credit card for when you go traveling, mm. and I've seen underwear, shoe shining, uh, mm. chocolates, alcohol, um, makeup. Um, things that you shouldn't really put on your company expenses that, that go on there. So um, there, there are little things, but also even things like people will just pay for a subscription for Adobe or MailChimp or LinkedIn on their card. And what they don't know is their business already has like a an agreement in place to buy it cheaper through, through the company. Yeah. So they're then paying even more on the credit card for something that they already have for free. So yeah, lots of interesting things like that. Yeah. I, I know that with the company credit cards, it's sometimes difficult I th because when I had mine from Bosch, but that I think that was a bit different. I, because this in the end, this also went to my, went to my account. But there were times when I had to use the company card because like I forgot my personal one or yeah. Then, then also there the thing different. is you can you so what I tend to see and can see is patterns in data. So if mm. it was one person, you would be able to tell from a pattern and trend in the spend. Like if they were doing that every week, yeah, like buying their newspapers, which you think, oh, it's not much money, so nobody will notice. But over the course of a year, how much does that add up to hundreds of pounds? And if every single employee did that, then that's thousands. It's those little, it's the little, little things that um, they think yeah. will kind of slip under the net. If it's, if it's once or twice, it, it can be an error or like this can be fixed easily. But if yeah. somebody does I mean, it all I've, the time. I've done it too for my own business. Um, you know, it happens occasionally. Yeah. But it's the other way too. I couldn't pay on my business card, so I had to pay on my personal card. Um, sometimes when I go to the US, it it won't let me tap. It needs to do the chip and pin, but then they don't have the chip and pin, so I can't pay for something. So yeah, yeah. Hey, so that, it, it, I think it comes then do. back to the accounting again, right? It, yeah. It, if it's a personal thing, then it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then there's the CRMs, you see. So you've uh. probably got a mailing list. I've got a mailing list. A lot of people watching will have mailing lists. Yeah. And if you've had one for a number of years, you end up with Robert Smith, Bob Smith, Rob Smith, maybe one email, but two different addresses, a couple of different phone numbers. And so you end up with like five versions of the same record. Mm. Even things like people putting in addresses, if it's Avenue, how do you spell Avenue? The full name or the abbreviation AV? You know, and then you end up with multiple versions of the same addresses. And so we will go through and tidy up all that. And yes, there are tools out there that can do that, but there's still always that part that the tech can't touch that has to be done by, by real people. And that's where my team and I come in to save the day. I yeah. call us the, the trash people of the data world think about it if you didn't get your trash collected every week society would literally fall apart like there would be rubbish everywhere disease like things would just fall apart it's the same with data in your organization if you're not keeping it clean regularly like you, your organization will fall apart at some point uh, it, it's a bit like data lakes if you just yeah. keep putting stuff in and like nobody takes care of it it's We'll get it's a swamp, a yeah. Before you know a swamp, it. a pile of data. <laughs> Nobody knows who who know, uh, who is responsible. Who will put it there? Are we still needing this? Yeah, it's... That's a great point, actually. Responsibility is normally a big issue. Nobody wants to take responsibility for for looking after something. Yeah, I'm guessing. Like, if you have a, a I'm guessing you're using HubSpot and and these these systems. You're, you're... I I got banned from HubSpot many years ago. What? <laughs> because guess what? Because of dirty data, I belonged to the Institute of Directors, and they have a database. So I got a database of 
uh, IT people, finance people, and procurement people. And I put these lists into HubSpot and I sent them an email. And the bounce rate was so high, they cut me off. They said, you, you're spamming people. No. Okay. So I, ne I have never looked back. Um, and then went to MailChimp because everyone was talking about, oh, I use MailChimp. And then they started limiting the number of free users. So I moved from MailChimp to MailerLite, which is what mm -hmm. I'm on now. But actually, I quite like that more. They've got a much more user-friendly kind of template than MailChimp. Hmm. But there's so many different options out there now. I, I went from, for, for my company, I went from MailChimp uh, to ConvertKit. That's, yeah, it's, I've heard a lot. It's, it's a lot not cheap. It's not cheap, but it's it's a good tool. It's, I just, yeah. if you if you come here from the email I just sent out, that was through ConvertKit. Um. Mm. Yeah, but your clients, they, they're using stuff like HubSpot and, and these these things, right? HubSpot, yeah. Um, and no matter what they say about, you know, you can use tools to clean up within the tool, they still need cleaned up. Hmm. How is that? There was a question about this. So how, how are you doing this? Are you then going into these systems and, and like by hand? Never, ever, ever. Going we always ask for exports okay we always we always create new columns and put the clean data in the new columns and we do that for two reasons one because then you can always trace back if something's gone wrong because you mm. can see the difference but also from a value perspective from the client's point of view they they don't know what a clean and a messy spreadsheet looks like they you know there's no difference to them because they're not looking at them every day whereas if you show them the before and the after they can visibly see what you've done and how you've improved their data. So then they kind of see the value um, and then they can import it back in. I mean, Salesforce, we get a lot of Salesforce as well. A lot of issues with data in there. Mm. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's from a, from a format perspective, that's more the traditional, you get exports and then you work with these exports. Yeah, and we don't use Excel. I know I talk about Excel a lot, but we don't actually use Excel in the business. Um, it is risky. Um, yeah. So we use a tool called Omniscope, which is a, an ETL and visualization tool in one. So we can do all our data modeling and the visualization in the one tool. We don't need to export it to BI or to Tableau or to Click. Uh -huh. um, and there, I've developed a methodology on how to clean and classify using this tool specifically, which is quite unique to this tool. So it gives us a, an edge on, on what we're doing. Mm. And then it, at the end, when you think, okay, now we got everything, then you basically do an, re, you do an export again for the customer and they import then the, the changes. They can do what they want. And actually, a lot of times um, with procurement specifically, they get their data from the finance system, but the finance data people need a different view than the procurement people. So they end up doing their own stuff over here that's separate to the finance mm -hmm. system so that they can get what they need. Oh, interesting. Which I know is creating silos, but it, for them to do their job properly until they develop a tool where you can have procurement and finance sitting happily side by side. Um, mm. That's how it's going to be. Mm. Um, <laughs> somebody, sorry, I just saw somebody say Omniboost. It's Omniscope. It's um, uh, V-I-S-O-K-I-O.com is the website. Vizokio.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Kate was asking, which tool do you use most for data classification? I'm guessing that's the tool. Yeah, and honestly, you can move and filter and, and do wizardry in a way that you can in any other tool I've, I've worked with. It's quite special. Hmm. Here's a question, Susan. Um, I know this is these are my initials, but that it's not me. <laughs> 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 no, uh, this person, please tell I, me I, there's more than one person watching this. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, he or her is a, that's a it's an, an, a very old uh, OG like, <laughs> viewer of mine. I don't know, like two, three years or four. Yeah. Maybe. 
Uh, yeah. um, so the question was, uh, how did you get your first clients? That's because really, people... really interestingly, actually, I didn't get my first client for 10 months in my business. I was at the point of nearly having to get a job when three projects came in and I'd actually accepted a job offer and started a job when I got the three projects and I stayed at the job for a month. But because I found very quickly that people were really interested in my services however nobody else was doing it as a standalone service so people weren't out there on google looking for data cleaning services because mm. nobody else was doing it and so i started you know messaging some people on linkedin and, and again they were interested but it wasn't the right time and so i i, I realized pretty quickly that me calling or emailing or messaging 100 people a day wasn't going to get me very far. It would be better to position myself as the go-to person when you have a problem. And so that's when I started kind of posting more and experimenting more on LinkedIn and sharing knowledge. And, and up until that point, I really had focused just on procurement people. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I started talking about data stuff, the data world kind of was like, yes, Yes, and I was so uh, scared in the beginning because I knew I was very good at my specific corner of data, but I've never claimed to be an expert in coding or data science or that. And and so I kind of had a little, quite a bit of imposter syndrome at the start. Like I kept saying, I'm not a data person. Why do these people want me in their community? Um, and I had to do a lot of work with my coach actually to kind of realize that I am a data person. I just specialize in a very mm. specific area. Um, so yeah, 10 months and, and it was just patience, a bit of luck. And even now it's still patience, a bit of luck and timing. You know, I, my lead time for getting a client can be anything up to from six to 12 months. It's never a like like a course, you know, you're not going to instantly buy it and then and then use it. It's okay, we've got a problem and we need some budget for it. And you know, mm. even I don't know what it's like in the data engineering world, but getting budget for cleaning data is pretty non-existent unless this is a crisis and then suddenly they find money from somewhere to fix the problem. Yeah, yeah, because usually the if there is money or if there is something where companies can make money, it's very easy. You get budget very easily for it. But if it's something like, okay, we have a problem or we can improve, oh, it's very, oh, we don't have any money. It's, it's, pockets are empty usually. Yeah, yeah. And even, even things like um, classifying spend data. Like if they went to bit one of the big consultancies, they'd be talking hundreds of thousands of pounds or dollars for the services that I offer. Mines are maybe like 50 to 100k mm. not even that much and yet they won't invest in it and they could you they could literally save millions and millions of pounds but they won't invest that little bit at the start it's crazy yeah so the yeah the, yeah. the problem isn't big enough right it doesn't hurt until enough. it's a crisis yeah it's, yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah 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 it's, it's not but so so that was would you say your social media actually helped you get the first clients um no not the first one. Oh, actually that's a lie it was i i sent a message to someone on linkedin and she said you need to speak to my colleague and that's and then and then from there it took 10 uh -huh. months to get the data yeah okay interesting yeah. so uh, and even but, now we don't have an outbound we don't have a sales team or we don't do any outbound selling all the business is is via inbound mostly via linkedin but now i also speak at a lot of events so some of it's starting to come come through that as well um but it's mainly linkedin still to this day isn't it cool it is i mean <laughs> i have i mean i i have been coasting it not coasting it but you know, we, we're project based work, so we can go months without any any work. And it's so it's very the income is like that. It's not steady at all. And, you know, we we nearly went under this year. We had cash flow issues. Um, but but something always comes around just when you need it. Hmm. 
It's meant to be. But you have to have pretty much balls of steel to to ride ride it out. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean for me it's the same thing with my with my students or with my academy. Yeah. I need to I need to talk about it. I need to show people how I can help them and show them the benefits and the yeah, I... months where people are more on vacation and then and then there are months yeah i i launched a course in january and i was so excited because nine people bought it in the first few days and then i think i've sold two since january since then because you have to you really have to invest so much time and effort and work but if i invest it in all that then i'm not investing it in the more the, the higher revenue generating side of the business so it's you know you have to you have to choose where to focus yeah 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 unfortunately that's often so that there, there is something you're passionate about but it's not the big money generator and when in your case when you have people working for you you like yeah yeah then suddenly it's you've got to pay their bills as well as your yeah. own <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's true it's true. i know but then also you know there's a flip side of that in that i wouldn't you know this year alone i spent three weeks in the US in May, I, I was in Orlando in September, I was at Big Data London, um, I'm off to Atlanta in another couple of weeks, I'm at the Alteryx cool. event in next week in London, this week in London even, you know, I wouldn't be able to do any of that if I didn't have a team to, to help with the heavy lifting in the mm. background, so it's, um, you know, it's, it swings and roundabouts, but I am completely unemployable, I could never go back to a job it's it's funny that i had that i i wanted to ask you that a, f a few minutes ago but i forgot about it like now that you know both <laughs> and you already oh, yeah. answered this like yeah i could not i mean honestly like like i say it's been a tough year and i really thought you know could i could i actually go and work for someone again and the answer was no i was like i have to make this work <laughs> yeah yeah, or, I'm, or I'm moving back with my dad in Dundee. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if if that's that's what you what you have to hey, do. That is my backup, backup, yeah. backup plan. So yeah, yeah. It's I for me. It's also I I learned that like I always had the the feeling that I should do something on my own. Yeah. And since I since I have my own company, work on. On my own topics, I'm in charge of what I what I want to do and what I do. Yeah, I I could not imagine going back to working for for someone. I know, and I think I realize now that I I think I always had that. I remember at university, I did one module called entrepreneurship, and I remember thinking, oh, it would be great to you know have my own business. I said, but I don't, you know, you need an idea. It's like I don't have an idea because I'm not a crafty, handsy person. And you know, at, at 20, 21, you don't have life experience to go off and be a consultant. So yeah. I guess it was always there, but kind of parked in the back of my brain. Yeah. yeah for me also, I like I I was I was learning, I went to university, then I worked at the job for 10 years, and through that, that actually led me to where I am now. Right? Be Same, because I without, without Yeah. Sorry? I was in sales. Yeah. But without that experience, would you have? Would I wouldn't you... be able to do the classification now. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. Very yeah. interesting how this works out. It is, yeah. So, now that we have been talking for a bit, what are yes. some horror stories, Susan? Oh, I know up? everyone always wants to do some stuff. <laughs> Actually, I saw a really good question, A.K. Again, what's the worst <laughs> project you've worked on? Um, I don't know if you find this, but it's. If you, if you don't make it clear with the client or the person you're working with from the very outset, like, what do you want and what's your end goal? It's a nightmare because mm. you keep doing work for them and they keep changing their minds and then they keep wanting something else. And then you're like, like, this is not in the statement of work. You're wasting all our time here. Um, another one is when... They are so focused in on the detail. I had um, one client literally check every single line of work that we classified. Okay. And it stood up. It, you know, she, she found little tiny, tiny things like, and we're talking, 
we had classified something as travel and it should have been travel train or travel bus okay. and it was just travel so that's the kind of you know so it stood up to the the test but that can be really um time consuming and draining and you know sometimes you have to focus on the bigger picture hmm. but so horror that, stories yeah yeah because that that's more like a problem with with people right so, so or, or data project. problems are people problems. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's a really uh, what great... I was what I was thinking is like more on what were some some horror stories with date with the data actually where like everything was messed up and uh, like oh yeah I've got loads of those too. So um, in the book, Train spreadsheets classifying fixing dirty data secret plug. Um, there is a data horror stories chapter and. Some, uh, a lot of people anonymously donated some data horror stories for the book. And then I chose the ones to put in. And one of my favorites is um, this company had um, sent out a mailing to all their members. But what had happened is on somewhere on the spreadsheet, the data had slipped. So the address was right, but the name was wrong. So it went out to hundreds of thousands of people or tens of thousands of people and <laughs> the marketing department were really angry with the IT department about this because they're like you've cost us all this money we're going to like internally sue you for this or charge you for it and uh and the 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 IT department actually managed to fix some of it but they also did some uh post analytics on it and it turned out that even though the name was wrong on the mailing, most of those people still renewed their membership, even though the name was wrong. The mailer was enough to prompt them to renew, but it caused like real internal conflict. Mm. Um, and I, I guess for me, the, the lesson there is I have a kind of triple check system. I'm, I'm always about check, check and check again. And when I don't do that, that's when things slip through the net. You know, so when we get some work in, it'll go to the team, it gets split out, it comes back together. One person will then look at the whole data set, check it, and then it'll come to me as well. Just to make sure that we've, you know, and nothing, you'll never get a per perfect data set. You know, stuff will always slip through, but it's about minimizing the errors. Yeah. yeah. I think there's too much focus on perfect. But that it's it's a bit of like expectation management right yeah if, if you have something like that lady you told before i was i guess she expected like this needs to be a hundred percent and exactly and yeah that's not life unfortunately um but i'd love to know um kind of what what can do you in in the engineering space, do you come across like common data errors, dirty data problems, things like that? That depends. So it it depends as well if this is user imported data or machine data. Ah, uh, that's For interesting. Instance, I had the when I was working. Um, back in the days when I would I did customization for SAP for a machine yeah. execution system, and there were also these. Uh, forms and were these masks where people had to put stuff in and that was always the problem like people yeah. putting in bs and then your process doesn't work and th these jobs fail and why does these jobs fail it's like somebody puts it in but also when i was working on iot projects you have that problem where data is getting delayed and then the timestamps don't fit anymore or oh. you have sensors and these sensors are measuring wrong stuff because they're broken and like this kind of stuff you have to oh. Oh, you have to figure out oh my goodness uh, so there are a thousand a thousand problems especially in the iot world you know that... what they need though they need the data coat the data the data coat c-o-a-t like a jacket yeah so i say make sure your data has its coat on so it's got to be consistent so like, let's use the, t the same time and date formats around the world. Let's make it the same. 
you know, how often, uh, actually, if anyone's watching, I'd love for them to just put how they format their dates in the chat because you get dashes, slashes, dots, no separators. You get day, month, year, month, day, year. You get all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. I've done that with single departments and everyone's doing different kind of formats. Um, so, yeah, make sure it's consistent. And units of measure, you know, UK versus or Europe versus US measurements, you know, is everyone yeah. using the same things? Um, then make sure it's organized. So categorize that however you need to find your information easily. And then, mm. of course, it's got to be accurate, but define what that is. You know, in sales and marketing, that might be certain data points, whereas in finance, it's like we have to have the exact numbers right. So when you've got your consistent, your organized, your accurate data, it becomes trustworthy. And mm. that's the word that you kind of, People always say, oh, we don't trust our data. So that's uh, that's what they need. Yeah, but like with the date, that, that's again, if you give people the option to add in the masks to, to just write the date there instead of having a selector and in the back end, it, it will always use the same format. Yeah that's already a problem like if you if you give people too many options make it like oh that's just a text field yeah like. <laughs> i know because people say you know drop down versus free text and actually both of them have their their benefits and their their problems it depends on what you're trying to to find mm. out because you know in 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 the categorization world in drop down people will often just choose the first thing. They don't even look at everything. And then you end up with loads of miscategorized data. It, it happens all the time. Yeah. Look, we've got a couple of dates coming in. Yep, they're all different. That's true. That's true. We're starting with month, please. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, like a year, do you do two or four? Four numbers yeah. for the year you know there's so many different combinations that you can have for the dates yeah that, that's that's a lot yeah. that's a lot just the date and how do you write that the if you have to use a time zone how is the time zone added oh. like? well also and and what happens is you, you get it all in your nice data lake and nobody knows that the dates are from different time zones and then everyone mm. just sticks everything together and then you're like oh no how do we unpick this? Yeah. Become swampy uh, very quickly. Yeah, that's true. That's true. What do we have here? Uh, any books you can recommend about data cleaning? Well, oh, wow. Yeah, you need Ooh. you need to send send me the link to that. I'm going to add it to the description after. Oh, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um anything any other book? Like how how or anything what would you in this field what would you recommend that people look at well i wrote this book because there, there's a lot of stuff like cleaning in sql cleaning in you know r python but this is cleaning just in excel in the basics like get to know the basics in excel mm -hmm. first um honestly there's not much out there um Find some, I mean, you know, I've got a more expensive course, but go and find a cheap course like for a fiver and go and have a look at that. You know, if, if it's a, a budgetary constraint, you know, something that I do with my course that is I give the attendees, students, um, a free dirty data set. So they go away mm -hmm. and play with their own dirty data. Nice. Um, because that's you often hear like oh it's hard to get dirty data sets or real dirty data sets so I have gone and dirtied a data set just for you guys um, but yeah it's um, honestly there's there's not much out there most people learn on the job like you say it's not we can't talk about it because we don't have problems they don't <laughs> that's true but, but generally, so the, because the data is very, um, how should I say this? Let me, let me try to phrase this right. The data is very specific for the domain, right? Mm -hmm. So would it be if somebody wants to get into, into cleaning data, into like classification or stuff like yeah. this to 
okay, I'm focusing on a specific domain, on a specific industry, on a specific part. Does that, does that make sense? You would be amazed at how transferable it is. I mean, uh -huh. just from starting with classifying some data, I've worked in numerous different industries um, on numerous different types of data sets. There are common kind of threads and processes that, that across it. You know, once you master one area, you can then start solving problems in other areas with the knowledge that you've gained. Hmm. So it's more, it's again, it's lots of spotting patterns and and things like that. I'm I'm a huge fan of companies owning and managing their own data because the more you look at it the more obvious it is when something's not right when you don't look at it for months at a time it's very hard to spot when something's wrong but if you're looking at you know sensor data every day and suddenly it's like same same number and then suddenly that number changes you're like oh that's not right I need to check that rather than a couple of months or a couple of weeks later and you're like oh what's this how did that happen not quite sure about that but there would there needs to be somebody there actually in the company who, who is in charge of this. I'm I'm guessing that's also something where companies struggle that to have somebody who actually tries to maintain this. Could, can, yeah, this and, but it's like it's like also um like cleaning your house. You know, if you clean it every week, it's going to be easier to maintain than if you only do it once every month or every two months. It's going to be harder work. So while it feels like such a chore for so many people, if you get in that routine of doing it mm. and you can then start to build in, once it's clean, you can start to build in automations and all kinds of things to help keep it clean. Hmm. That makes sense. D did you have any, like, let's just call it companies that needed your services for multiple multiple times in a short while <laughs> like so I, i've had clients who've come back for different areas that needed clean okay. um and then we do do some regular kind of refreshes for some companies um but i think they'd probably be too embarrassed to come back and say we need you to fix it again uh, because I, i'm guessing like you're doing when you when you are finished, everything is clean, but then somebody needs to maintain it, and that never it, happens. Like it, you know, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I know that happens, and 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 literally, so like it, it's a bigger cost up front, but for a large organization, a couple of thousand dollars a quarter to maintain it is nothing, you know, but oh, we don't have the budget. Mm. But then, then you'll need a hundred grand to fix it when it's all wrong. It's strange how this works sometimes. Yeah. There's a question. I this I have no idea what this means exactly. I'm guessing this is some UK thing. How do the contracts work? Are they essentially uh, outside okay. IR35? Yeah, so I'm not a sole yeah. trader. I am a limited company and I have employees. So we are uh, an organization. So they they we don't ever go on site we never i have hardly met any of my clients in person ever um i mean 50 percent of the work we do is in the us um so we we you know we're not we're not an implant in in that organization we we take the work into the classification guru and quite often we are juggling multiple projects at the same time so it, that's not a problem what what's this IR thirty five? Oh, it's a minefield, is is what it is. It's 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 the definition of whether you're perceived to to be an employee or not. So you might be a contractor, but effectively you're being treated as an employee. So then you should be on payroll, and you should uh... be an employee and have you know pension and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of people don't want to be employees; they want to be contractors. Yeah, we we have that actually in Germany because yeah the, uh, actually I, I just I don't remember now how, now exactly how it's called but uh, that you treat the other way around that you treat people like contractors 
but and they want to be contractors they are they would count as employees if you right make, if you make errors yeah it's yeah it's, it's, it's a dangerous thing yeah okay no. but yeah if you're a company it's um well actually yeah so the the tax uh, people in the uk i'm hoping to actually go and speak to them um at their data science event online mm -hmm. do a little talk on dirty data dirty dirty tax data <laughs> i hope i hope they don't check my my account <laughs> before i go though that's why we have accountants so, <laughs> so yeah. we don't have to worry too much about this yeah um, yeah otherwise this would be like a, a minefield you're yeah it, okay. yeah even even for me with my contractors my contractors also have engagements with other companies or other clients mm. Because if they were just working with me, then that would be seen as an employer, could be seen as an employer-employee relationship. So it's so messy. Yeah, it's, that's how it is. Yeah. Um, they just want to make as much tax from us as possible. That's what it is. There, there's the thing, there's this saying, I don't know if you have this in, in, in uh, England as well, if you're worrying about taxes, you're not making enough money. So <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like to see it this way. Oh, don't don't forget about the tax stuff because, yeah. because you could you could argue about it for weeks. Yeah. Like in Germany, it's crazy. But yeah. yeah. Anyways, um, let's add, let's have one more question, and then we're we're gonna go. Any recommendations for starting caring about data quality in legacy code bases? Mm. Especially when there's no quality. Oof, is that a question for you? Well, I think caring about data quality full stop is important. And you kind of have to talk to people and get them to understand the what's in it for me. And that each person, that would be something different, but it could be making your work life easier. It could be helping get a bonus at the end mm. of the quarter or the year. It could be helping your friend out in a different department because, you know, whatever you do makes their life easier. Um, it could be just freeing up time, you know, so you could do other other bits of the job that need to be done because everybody I know nowadays um, is doing like one and a half jobs. Nobody has like the luxury of spare time. So, you know, mm. data quality is a great way to work more efficiently so it's it's just getting people to to see that and relate to it and understand it and that's where the whole talking in different language to different people comes into play yeah i like that uh, that basically telling them or showing them that it's a benefit for them yeah not another another chore to do oh that's that's nice that's a nice ending susan <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much thank you here. We're here. i really enjoyed that i could have spoken for another hour on this yeah me too but next time all right Best, Let, let's do this again say, um end on a high and things exactly <laughs> we'll 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 chat again here yeah all right okay have a good one thanks, thanks everyone thanks everybody for being here i'll see you soon bye